I'll give you all a few interesting facts throughout this lesson, and I'm going to ask some, some of you the points. Anyway, I've started recording, so let's jump into it, and I'll just uh, share on other devices. Good. All right, so you should all be able to see my screen in a couple of seconds. Perfect. Now, just to reiterate, everyone, we're going to go back to face-to-face uh, -face learning after November 9th for this class. And that's because after November 9th, I would have finished all of my exams. And so your regular face-to-face -face classes then. And usually it's by then that all the regulations would allow group setting classes. So I'm looking forward to seeing you all then. And I think you'll all see how different face-to-face -face learning is, especially with me, because uh, that's probably my forte when I, that's why I love teaching as well. It'd be great if some of you could turn your cameras on. I don't expect, I know some of you can't due to home situation or audio or video issues, but if you can turn your camera on, it would be great because then I can get maximum interaction with all of you. But uh, let's continue. All right, now, one thing you'll all realize is every week, whenever I teach you new content, I always start off with a recap on what we learned last lesson. And I do this through quizzing each and every one of you. Now, we learned last lesson about reproduction and sexual and asexual reproduction, which are the first key components of this entire module. So I guess we'll start with Kirthana. Kirthana, what's the difference between sexual and asexual reproduction? How would you describe Sexual it? is like genetic variation. Good. Very good. So you've given me the most important points. In sexual reproduction, we have genetic variation. How many parents do we need for sexual reproduction, Jessica? Um, two. Typically, you'd need two, but are there any cases where you only need one parent for sexual reproduction? Yeah, in plants, like Very good. pollination and stuff. Very good. So we've kind of written in here, self-pollination is an example where one plant can use its own gamete or sex cell, which is the pollen, to fertilize its own ova. Very good. Now, Georgina, what process do cells use to make these gametes, so spermatozoa and ova? What was the name of that process? Uh, meiosis. Very good. And Alyssa, when we engage in meiosis, how many daughter cells do we make? So we've got one parent cell, how many daughter cells does that split into? Any ideas? Maybe pass it on to Tanisha. How many daughter cells do we produce, Tanisha, in the process of meiosis? Um, four. Very good. All right. Now, I know Rhea, you weren't here last lesson, but hopefully you watched the recording. So we'll start with the different life forms, and I'm going to ask you all and mention one life form, and you're all going to tell me one mode of reproduction. OK, so the simplest life form is a bacteria and we know that they're prokaryotic. They're the only cells that are prokaryotic. So if you ever see a prokaryotic cell, it is a bacteria. Now, Rhea, what type of replication or reproduction do bacteria engage in? Um, from what I remember, it was asexual. Very good. So that's very important to highlight asexual. Do you remember the specific name, how they how they divide? Binary fission. Yeah, good. And now I'm going to tell you all an interesting fact, and I'm going to ask you all this again. For every one human cell that's on your body that's making you up, there are 10 bacterial cells. So technically, we're all more bacteria than human cells, right? And so it forms this microbiome. It's kind of like a coat all over your skin, all over your body tissues. In all of your tracts, you have a huge amount of bacteria. And there are certain theories about the type of bacteria you have and certain diseases that you can get. So there are certain theories that individuals with autism, as you know, it's a communication disorder. Uh, the disease is actually because of inflammation and an altered set of bacteria in the gut. So there's a lot of theories about how the gut and bacteria in the body can interact with the brain function and cause disease as well. Good. Pranav? What's a type of reproduction of protozoa? There's binary fission, and then they also have budding as well. Very good. And Abhishek, if I looked under a microscope and I saw malaria, which is one of the most important protozoa, kills children every two to five minutes, so it's a huge life-threatening disease, what would I see? 
How many cells? Would it be unicellular, multicellular? Would it be prokaryotic or eukaryotic? Um, it'd be eukaryotic and Very unicellular. Good job. That's all you need to say. Forget everything else. Some of them can cause disease, but the two most important things about pro protozoa or protists that you need to know are the two things Abhishek's mentioned. Very good. And finally, we move on to fungi. So, Tanisha, fungi, unicellular or multicellular? It can be either. Very good. Good job. I like that you've all come in revised and everything. So I'm very happy with that. And uh, Ethan, how do fungi reproduce? Any ideas? Give it a go. How do fungi reproduce? We might ask uh, Cushy in the time, but Ethan, if your mic doesn't work, comment it down below. But I do want every one of you to give it a go when you answer questions. Oh, no, sorry. My internet just like cut out for a while, so I couldn't okay. hear anything. No worries, no worries. So I was just asking how fungi reproduce. Any ideas? Uh, I don't know how to pronounce it. It's like A O yeast. I don't know how to pronounce it. Okay. So are you mentioning yeast? Is that what you're referring to? No, no. Um, okay. It says A O E. No, it's asexual, right? Yep, yep. So it is, yeah. it can be asexual or sexual. So we'll go to cushy, cushy fungi, right? So typically, fungi cause skin diseases in humans. You've heard of athlete's foot, you've heard of uh, potentially ringworm, and there are certain diseases that literally half of all pregnant women get, like thrush, where you get this cottage cheese like discharge in the oral or reproductive cavity. So fungal diseases are very common, and all of you right now, this very second, have a ton of fungi that are kept at very low quantities by competing with the bacteria on your skin. So Cushy, if I looked at a fungus under a microscope, how would it be dividing? What are two methods? Like divided or like reproduce? So remember, when we're talking about cells, right? When they're dividing, that is how they reproduce. When a bacteria divides, we call that its mode of reproduction, right? Yeah. It's only when we talk about organisms like you and I that division is different to reproduction. Does everyone realize that? Every one of your cells, every 48 hours on average, will double. But we don't say you, you have reproduced. But when we talk about cellular organisms, so organisms that are made up of one or a couple of cells, they're going to reproduce through uh, cell division. So yeah, so you can call it reproduction or cell division. So for fungi, how do they reproduce? Uh, is it through budding and like spores? Is Very that good. I, I think you're all doing what I told you to do, which is you take one mode of reproduction from the previous organism and you add a new one. So for bacteria, we add binary fission. Protist, you take the binary fission, you add budding. For fungi, you take the budding and you add spore formation. That's how easy it is. And final mm -hmm. question, since all of you have done so well. Raya, fungi, is it sexual or asexual reproduction? And extension question, when do you know? Give it a go. So sexual or asexual, start off with that. Fungi and reproduction. Okay, we might come back to you, Raya. Harsha? I'm not sure. Okay, let's think about this. Harsha, when something is sexual reproduction, are gametes always involved? Yes or no? Yes. Very good. So that's one of the most important things. The reason we get genetic variation is because gametes are involved, and Georgina pointed out that gametes are made from meiosis. And whenever you have meiosis, you don't need to know how yet, but meiosis causes variation. And so the gametes will be varied. So when they combine the zygote, or the offspring zygote will also be varied. Okay, good. So when we have spores, spores can be what we call diploid or haploid. Asha, you want to define those two words, diploid and haploid. What does that even mean? Um, a diploid cell has like uh, double the copies of the chromosome amount, and haploid has half. Yeah, I, I don't want you all to think double. So often you'll see the word that diploid, you'll see this little number next to it called 2n. 2n is not is actually the normal number of chromosomes you should have. So all humans have 46 chromosomes. So we say 2n is equal to 46. But during the process of meiosis, one cell 
will split into four daughter cells. They'll all be genetically varied. And each cell will have an N number of chromosomes. If it was a human cell, only if it was a human cell, would that be 23? You have to remember every different species has a different diploid number and that's a different haploid number. Okay, so the definition of diploid is normal chromosome number. Definition of haploid is half. Remember, haploid has a H, H for half. Okay, good. So basically, the reason I brought this up, everyone, is it all depends on whether those spores are haploid or diploid. If the spores are diploid, would that be sexual or asexual reproduction? Let me ask uh, Jessica, what do you think? If you have a diploid spore, sexual or asexual reproduction? Sexual. Asexual. I want you to think about this. If you have a diploid spore, does it have the total correct number of chromosomes it needs to? No. Remember, the parent organism is always diploid. If I, if I plucked any one of your cells, Jessica, your skin cell, your hair cells, they would all be diploid cells, right? So they have the normal chromosome number. So when you have a diploid spore, it already has the correct chromosome number. Does that make sense to everyone? It doesn't need any additional chromosomes. So all a diploid spore needs to do is germinate in the ground and it will grow into a new fungus. Does that make sense to everyone? So a diploid spore, since it already has a correct chromosome number, simply needs to germinate and form a new fungus. However, Pranav, if we produce a haploid spore, such as the case with this little flowchart diagram, a haploid spore, Pranav, do we have the correct chromosome number? No, because we only have like half, like Good. 23 yet. Exactly. So we need another set of N chromosomes to form the correct number of chromosomes, which is 2N. Does that make sense to everyone? So that would mean we'd need another spore from another fungus to come along and fertilize that spore. And now you have to realize, well, the two spores came from two different fungi, which had different genetic information. Tanisha. Will the offspring fungus be genetically varied or would it be genetically identical to the parents? Varied. Varied, right? Exactly. And so we'd call this sexual. So the key point here is fungi can engage in sexual or asexual reproduction depending on uh, the type of spore, whether it's a diploid spore or a haploid spore. Very good. Now, what you're actually seeing here, have a look at this seeing something quite interesting. Can anyone interpret this diagram for me? Because in the HSC, they'll love to give you application concepts, something like this. And they can ask you to interpret what's going on here. So everyone, for this question, I guess the first thing I have is, is this sexual or is this asexual reproduction? What do we think? Think hard. Georgina, what do you think? Sorry, what was the question again? It's sexual or asexual reproduction for this fungi that's reproducing here? Asexual. So we see there are N chromosomes. So you might be thinking, well, another spore needs to come to produce two N chromosomes. But what do you all notice? This new fungus has half the number of chromosomes that it needs to have. And it's still formed a completely functional fungus. So this is what I mean. Fungi are quite complex, but there are cases where they can produce a whole new organism with half the genetic material required. OK, so I guess the key point here you need to realize is that fungi are complex. They can engage in sexual and asexual reproduction through spore formation. Now, what is this? This word here? Hyphae. It's something we look at in medicine. When we're looking at microscopic samples of fungal diseases in humans, one of the diagnostic features that tells me that there is a fungal infection is I will see on the microbiology report, there will be hyphae. Does anyone know what these hyphae are? Any ideas? Tanisha, what is a hyphae? They're kind of like the branches of the fungi. Yeah. Like very good. To put it in a word. 
and they tear like they kind of just go under the skin and invade the multicellular organism. Yeah, so if the fungi is a pathogen, meaning it causes disease, then sure, the, the hyphae will be used for invasion. The hyphae are kind of branches that can be used for reproduction, so they can have spores on their ends as well. Very good. And the other word you see here is that sporangia, and that just refers to a structure that contains spores. You'll see those big spherical structures here, and they release all these spores. So since it contains spores, we call it the sporangia. Very good. Good job. I think that's it for fungi. That's all you will need to know for fungi. OK, so as long as you got those key points, does anyone have any questions before I move on? Any questions at all? OK. Good. Good job. So now I want to quickly talk about plants. We spoke about plants in terms of pollination. And I think I stress to you all, self-pollination is sexual reproduction. That is the most important thing. The reason is that those pollens and ova, even if it comes from the same plant, was made by meiosis. And every single sex cell is different, even if it's from the same parent, because it was made by meiosis. Okay? So that's when they combine every offspring or seed for a plant has genetic variation. Good. All right. Now, what does zygote mean? Who wants to define that to me? Zygote, the term. Ria, what does zygote mean to you? The term zygote. Um, isn't zygote just a new offspring? Like the union of the female and male sex cells? Good. So it's the first diploid cell that's formed in reproduction. Do you all agree? When two gametes combine, they're both haploid, but when they unite, you would make a diploid or full chromosome number cell. So all of you once upon a time were just one single zygote and you were sitting in the fallopian tube. And then as you roll down into the uterus, you would have replicated multiple times. So I'll show you this. It's a quite interesting image. And it's a big question that I have for all of you. So this is an image of the uterus. It's kind of like a side view. So if you imagine uh, looking at someone's side and cutting the uterus right in half, you would see this cross section here. So that's how you orient yourself. OK, good. Now, I have a very important question for all of you. Where did that zygote implant? I think you all generally know that there are ovaries, there are fallopian tubes, and that's going to connect to the uterus. Now, fertilization, I'm going to help you all out. Fertilization happens in the fallopian tube. So that's when the spermatozoa will meet the ova. Now, where does this zygote, so remember the zygote is one cell, starts dividing into two, four, six, twelve. Where does it go once it reaches the uterus? What does it do? Does anyone know? Lookman? Um it embeds itself into the endometrium. Very good. I like that you used a very important word, endometrium. So the endometrium is the lining cells of the uterus, and it's very rich in nutrients like glucose. It also has a lot of water and fluid as well. So that's exactly where the embryo will grow. And what you'll see happening is that it will then grow out of the wall of the uterus like this until it grows into a fetal stage. So after about week 12, it stops looking like an alien and uh, you see a actual healthy fetus. Now, one of the most interesting organs for me is the heart. And that's because it's one of the most versatile organs. It starts, it's one of the first organs to start functioning and it is the last organ to stop. When it stops, you are diagnosed as dead. So, we have never been able to mimic a structure like the heart. Even in 2021, with all the technology we have, there is no machine that can copy the function of the heart for a long time period. And that's because it's such a complex, interesting conducting system and uh, pumping system. Does anyone know when the heart starts beating for, a, for an embryo? We check this. And this is how we know whether there is a viable pregnancy, whether the heart is beating. Anyone know when? So a normal pregnancy is about nine months. Anyone know when 
or what day the heart starts beating? I'd guess two or three weeks. <laughs> Spot on. Very good. Virginia, maybe you're ready to become a cardiologist or a pediatric cardiologist already. So day 21, that is when your heart started beating. And remember, it is the last organ to stop when you pass away. So it's one of the most sustaining and one of the most long-term, more interesting organs in the human body. So anyone who's interested in cardiology or even cardiothoracic surgery, which is heart surgery, I guess this is a little bit of an intro into when this all starts happening. Good. All right, let's move on. We're going to come back to fertilization. It's actually quite important because you need to learn about hormones in pregnancy. So I just gave you a little bit of an initial taster. Now, you need to also understand asexual reproduction in plants. Now, we said if you ever mention the word pollination, Jessica mentioned it's always sexual, which is very good. Now, for asexual reproduction, for a plant, this is quite literally mitosis of that plant. And so I need you all to tell me what mitosis is. So, Sachita, do you want to explain to us what mitosis is? Any idea? So any general explanation or description about my mitosis? Well, um, growth and development as well as repair. And it's uh, two identical cells are formed, I think. Good. I like that you you prefaced the perf the purpose. So the very good structure. We need it for growth. So that zygote, when it became an embryo and fetus, it utilized a massive mitosis. Very good. Repair, very important. When you damage your skin, when you get any form of injury, you're going to get mitosis of cells. An interesting point to all of you, you'll realize in medicine, whenever there is chronic repair of tissue, let's say someone has an ulcer in their stomach, or let's say someone has a uh, some damage in their large intestines, that increases your risk of cancer because whenever cells are dividing a lot, they get the chance of getting a mutation and thus increasing their replication. And that's what a cancer is. It's a cell that does not stop mitosis. Okay, so very important concept there. And finally, maintenance. We need it to maintain the number of cells and tissue. And the aging process you all see when people get, you know, wrinkles and their skin starts to sag, it's all because the cell number in that tissue starts to drop, right? So that's the aging process. So very good. Now, one cell divides into two. And I guess the key thing I want to know, look, man, I want you to give this a go. Are these cells daughter cells? Are they going to be identical or are they going to be varied? Uh, identical. Very good. So you make two genetically identical cells. Now, look, man, I'm going to give you a bit of a tough question here. Is it the entire cell that's exactly identical or is it just the nucleus? Um, just the nucleus. Very good. Very good. It's a big trap that a lot of students fall into. And it's that the goal of mitosis is to make an identical nucleus. Remember, the nucleus is what carries all the DNA. Apart from that, logically speaking, everyone, if I have a pizza and I split it into two, I'm not going to get two equal sized pizzas. It has to be half the size, right? So in the same way, in mitosis, the two daughter cells will be much, much smaller. Okay, so they will not be exactly identical except for that nucleus. So a very important point. So identical nucleus is what I will stress for all of you. Good. So the reason I brought this all up, I'm going to stop there. There's much more to mitosis, but we'll come back to that. The principle here is whenever a plant undergoes asexual reproduction, we call that vegetative propagation. So going up to going down, yeah, it's termed vegetative propagation. Propagation means continue or make more of, and it's vegetative because we're talking about plants. Okay, so remember this process is just mitosis. Okay. Now, I know plants aren't too interesting, but I guess the reason you're learning about plants is because plants offer you a window of insight into the complexity of humans. There are a lot of similarities at a cellular level between a plant and a human. So when you understand how plants reproduce, human reproduction and cell reproduction makes much, much more sense. OK, and the other interesting thing, plants are actually quite interesting when you take a deep look into them. Do they have an immune system? Everyone, plants. Do plants have an immune system? Abhishek, 
What do you think? Um, I don't think so. In mod seven, you learn that they actually do. They have ways to identify if they're being infected. They have ways internally to tell the time. That's something we have struggled to understand even with a human body, but we understood better with plants that they have a circadian rhythm, right? So it's quite interesting that plants are not just, you know, sitting around looking green and pretty. They actually are very complex. In fact, they're one of the only life forms on this planet that can literally take energy from the sun and convert it to chemicals, which we as humanity have never or likely will never ever be able to do. Good. Coming back to vegetative propagation, we said mitosis full stop right? So I guess the only thing you need to know is a type of vegetative propagation. And the way you break this down to make your life very easy is what are the two parts of a plant? Literally, a plant can be divided into this, this artistic Picasso depiction. It's a leaf and it's a stem for all of you who are confused about what you're looking at. And I've drawn some squiggly lines at the bottom. So I'm going to divide it here. There'll be an upper portion and a lower portion. Hasha, what do we call the upper portion and what do we call the lower portion? Any ideas? Uh, the lower portion is the root system. Yeah, exactly, right? Roots. And what are the upper portion? The stem. Yeah, the, the stem, we call the entire thing the shoot system. So that's all I want you to know, right? It's either the shoot system or, yes, as you can mention, you can call it the stem. And I guess just to give you a bit more terminology, there are often branches off that main stem, and we call those stalks. Okay, so this is your stem, your stalk. So the different types of vegetative propagation just have to do with the different parts of that plant that undergo mitosis to make an identical daughter plant. Okay, so I guess the first one you can understand are runners. And I will urge you all, don't memorize this in too much detail. In the HSC, they're never going to say, give me an example of a runner. It's very low yield. The HSC does not work that way. It'll always be application questions. So as long as you get the idea of thinking about it, I'm happy. Okay? So mitosis of the shoot or the root. And if it is mitosis of that shoot system, we can call it a runner. So a runner is an example where the stem undergoes mitosis to make a new plant. Full stop. That's all you need to know. OK, if you'd like, just understand the spin effects is one example. And you can all see that happening, right? If you look deep closely at what's going on, that's we do it in a different color. That could be a shoot system. And off that stem, you get this runner and it's making new plants. Does everyone see that? New plants that are forming from mitosis of that stem, which is part of the shoot system. So the spin effects grass is one example of a plant that does that. OK, there are many other examples of giving you tubers, rhizomes, all these fancy terms. Again, like I told you, they're never going to ask you for specific plant examples, but I would say just remember two. So I remember runners and I remember rhizomes because they sound funny, but uh, you can pick whatever you'd like. There's suckers as well, which are root systems, as we spoke about. And uh, I've given you an example plant for every single one. OK. But like I'm telling you all, this is low yield. The only way they ask you, I'll show you a question. This is from the 2020 HSC paper. I think you've all done this question possibly, but uh, give it a go. 30 seconds before I start asking you. Hopefully this question will teach you something very important, which is, the goal of MCQ in biology. A lot of students don't understand it, even going to year 12. Varun, any ideas what you think the answer could be? Take me through A. Just go A, B, C, and D. Because remember, for MCQ, the goal is eliminating the crap answers, right? You always want to work through the process of elimination. So take me through A, Varun. Yeah, so A, pollination caused by dispersal of seeds. What do you think about that? Uh, I think it's a viable option because pollination in, is the um, sexual reproduction in plants. So, Good job. Okay, we'll come back to that. What about B? So, like you, I would have put a question mark here, first of all. But let's keep going. Uh, let me ask uh, Raya, what do you think about B? 
Now, this word, what do you think about that, Raya? Okay, guys, if your mic doesn't work, either comment it in the chat section so I know, but I always want you to give it a go because otherwise you will not gain anything from uh, questions. So I, I guess I'll go to Tashvia. Cloning, what do you think about cloning? Um, I think we can um, like cancel out B as an option because cloning means like identical. Yeah, so exactly. You learn the mechanisms as to how humans have managed to clone organisms like Dolly the sheep, which is pretty insane. And I'll teach you all why Dolly died so quickly. But uh, yeah, B is not correct because yeah, cloning quite literally means identical copy. So that's very wrong. So if I asked you about plant cloning, hopefully all of you would say vegetative propagation is how you clone a plant. OK, there are many other ways, but one way is literally enabling vegetative propagation to occur. Good. C, what did I say about mitosis? I, I stress this, Ethan. What did we say about mitosis? Identical or non-identical cells? Oh, it, it's identical. Yeah, so it's not involved in sexual reproduction. And remember, meiosis is how we make pollen grains. Remember, gametes, like pollen, which is the male gametes, like the spermatozoa of a, of a human, is made by meiosis. So it's a varied haploid cell. So it's definitely not C. And what about D? So we'll come back to Varun. What do you think about D? Uh, so fertilization as a result of fusion of male and female gametes uh, like at first impression it's because this is sort of like zygotes I th I'm thinking and and it's I, I'm thinking it's more so with like humans rather than plants. So Varun you're spot on it's, it's not even that it's sort of this is quite literally how you make a zygote a fusion of a male and a female gamete is the process by which you make a zygote now I'll give you a little hint Varun I would have stressed it if it was very important did I ever stress that zygotes are only to do with humans I don't uh, I don't think, remember you saying that yeah, so that would mean that zygotes is a universal term for any fusion of male and female gametes. Now, pollen, Varun, is that a male or female gamete in a plant? A uh, male. Good. And the ova, which is like a human ova, is that a male or female gamete? A female gamete. Good. So the fusion of pollen and ova occurs in pollination. It can happen with pollen and ova of the same plant, which is self-pollination of pollen and ova of a different plant, which is cross-pollination. Both will make a zygote, and that zygote will eventually divide in a seed. It might be sitting in a fruit to entice humans to eat it and then excrete it into the environment so a new plant can grow. So it's quite a smart, nifty trick that plants have. But D is something where you can't find a fault. I think you're looking for one, which is very good. That's how you should be approaching every question. But with that MCQ with D, we can't find anything wrong with it. Because that is what sexual reproduction involves. It involves gametes that will fuse to form a zygote. Literally, word for word, every form of sexual reproduction involves gametes that will fuse by fertilization to form a zygote. That is the definition. That is why it's sexual. So what about A? Can anyone tell me what's wrong with A? I'll give you a hint because there is something very wrong with it. Lookman? Well, pollination is not actually caused by the dispersal of seeds. There Instead, it's caused by the pollen actually landing on the stigma, then going down to the ovary. Perfect, right? So pollination is quite literally the, the movement of pollen down the stigma style and over of another plant or the same plant itself. Seed dispersal is a whole other thing. I think this is what they were testing that we need pollination and that pollination is going to form a seed and an event that happens after all of the pollination will be a method of seed dispersal. Has anyone blown a dandelion? Maybe picked one up from the grass, made a wish, you know, thinking you might go to the North Pole and blown it away. Now, what you just did was you encouraged seed dispersal. You were a, a victim <laughs> of that plant and it used you and your kinetic energy for its own seed dispersal. So that's a mechanism that happens after the seed is formed. But when we're talking about pollination, 
the seed hasn't even formed yet. You need it to form the seed. So the causation is what is completely incorrect. So that would make D your answer and A would be incorrect. So hopefully this question taught you that for HDC bio, there'll always be two answers that are completely bad. There'll be two answers that are similar and the goal of the HSC is to find the best answer. Does that make sense? There might be two correct answers. You want to nitpick them and find the better answer. And that is what makes MCQs hard in bio. You sometimes will get two correct answers. You will just have to look at the wording and find which one makes more sense and which one is less incorrect. Okay, good. Good job. All right, let's move on. I think we all understand plants. Do we have any questions about any of the modes of reproduction so far. You should now understand what every single cell looks like and the mode of reproduction of every single cell. And this will come back to you in mod seven because what they're going to do in mod seven is they're going to describe a disease. They're going to tell you what you will see under a microscope and they'll ask you, what's the bug causing disease? And that's something that we do in medicine quite literally every single day. We microscopy samples to look at whether there is a protozoa like malaria, whether it's a bacteria, like, for example, tuberculosis or a virus like COVID-19. Okay, good. All right, let's move on. We have no further questions. So questions like this, I'm not going to get you to do it just yet. This will be part of homework. And uh, just prefacing, those of you who didn't get access until later in the week, don't worry right now, because remember, as I told you, I collect homework all in one prior to you sitting your exams. So when you sit your exams, uh, when we return to face-to-face -face learning, you're going to get physical copies of all these booklets. You would complete all the questions and you will hand it to me to be eligible to sit your Mod 5 exam and continue, okay? So I want you to just be completing it as you go. And uh, I guess for now, for this week, the homework I'll give you all would be the homework on page, so checkpoint F. That would be your homework for this week. Okay. Good. All right. So now we're starting to talk about our multicellular organisms. We've spoken about everything except animals. I hope you all realize that. So with animals, this is where you realize that mitosis and meiosis are not a mechanism of reproduction. And I hope you all understand that. All right. So just to reinforce this to all of you, I zoom in and draw it for you. Mitosis, as was mentioned, is important for growth, repair, and maintenance. We need it to have a functional number of cells in the human body, right? And we need it for our genes and our DNA to be stable, right? So that's the goal of mitosis. It's just to persist and keep you alive in very simple terms. Meiosis has one goal. What's the one goal of meiosis? Let me ask Pranav. To create like sex cells which are genetically varied. Very good. Create four genetically varied gametes or sex cells, right? Now what we then need is we need gametes to combine from two organisms. So gametes from organism one and organism two and the mechanism of combining the gametes is termed reproduction. So never mix up mitosis, meiosis, and reproduction. Hopefully you'll understand that. And once you have that mechanism of reproduction, you will then produce a new organism. You'll make a zygote, and that zygote will multiply, divide by mitosis to eventually form a new organism. Okay? So if I dumb this down, let's zoom out here. If I asked you, what are the three processes that are essential to continuity of a species, what three processes would you all say? Hint, it's all in front of you right now. Georgina? What three processes, sorry, what? Are important for continuity of a species? Um, reproduction is one. Keep going. Um, the two M's, Georgina, there's only two other processes here because everything else is an identifying a structure, right? A gamete is a structure, a zygote is a structure. What are the two other processes that you see in this little flowchart diagram? Mitosis and meiosis. Yes, 
So I want you all to remember this. If you were ever asked a question about continuity of a species, you need to talk about threes, three terms. OK, and I have not explained to you yet how this ensures continuity of a species, but hopefully you get the basic gist. You need mitosis to make more cells, keep an organism alive, repair that organism's tissues. And then once that organism reaches reproductive age, it'll start meiosis, making gametes. And then the mechanism of combining the gametes is reproduction. OK, very good. Now with animals, we term the reproduction as being internal or external. Does anyone know what that means? Internal versus external. Maybe I'll ask uh, Lookman. Yeah, give it a go. Um, so internal is when fertilization happens inside of the body and external is when fertilization happens outside of the body. Very good. Now, Lookman, carry on question. What kind of organisms engage in internal and what kind of organisms engage in external fertilization? So internal will be terrestrial organisms and for external will be aquatic organisms. Perfect, right? And I think you'll realize this. The key feature, right, and this makes sense because when you look at the human body, 60% of your mass is just water. And that's because every one of your cells need to be suspended in solution. Otherwise, they will dry up in what we call desiccation. So I'll write the word for you so you don't get confused by this. But desiccation literally means drying up. Okay, and you see it right there as well. Okay, so the goal is we do not want our gametes to desiccate. Now imagine the two scenarios. If you're a terrestrial organism, terrestrial, the land is very dry. Okay, and it lacks a lot of water. So you would always want these gametes to be in an aqueous or watery environment. So you will ensure that gamete one meets gamete two in an aqueous or moist environment. That's typically inside the body of an organism. If you're in an aquatic environment, aquatic environment, remember all around you, you have water. So there is no risk of desiccating gametes. So what aquatic organisms typically do is that they'll just release their gametes into the water. They won't even need to engage in intercourse or copulate. They just release their gametes into the water. And another fish, for example, will have the other set of gametes. And it can also release its gametes, which could be the eggs. And those two gametes will meet and you will get the zygote. And that will fertilize. So that fertilized zygote will form a new organism. Now, you already all knew this. Can you raise your hand if you've seen Finding Nemo? Come on, all of you should have seen. I know it's an old movie, but yeah, good. All of you have seen Finding Nemo. It's a legal requirement for biology, right? In Finding Nemo, the first scene, you see all those little eggs, and you see, I think, one of the parent uh, fish was going and checking up on their eggs. That should tell you the egg, that fertilized egg, was outside of the human body. That's because a fertilization happened outside of the human or the in this case, the fish's body, right? Contrast that to humans. The fertilized egg sits in the fallopian tube and, as we mentioned, goes inside into the, into the uterus and implants into the endometrium. So it's always inside the female reproductive tract at all times, never leaves. And that's because if it were ever to leave to the outside environment, it would desiccate and die. So I guess the key principle here is that internal fertilization is when fertilization, which is a union of gametes, we'll just quickly define that union of gametes occurs in the female reproductive tract. And external fertilization is when it occurs in the external environment. And the reason this occurs is because we do not want gametes to desiccate. That is the goal. Now, can anyone tell me what is the con of fertilization happening in the internal body because you might be wondering well why did evolution let fish just release the over into the waterway why didn't they also do internal fertilization because it's moist inside a fish's body as well so why did fish evolutionarily engage in external fertilization versus internal any ideas because they didn't want periods so Menstruation is actually very different to a, to a fertilization process. We'll talk about that soon, but menstruation or the ovarian cycle is to do with 
fertilization and implantation not occurring in Tunisia. So, uh, yeah, you what? You I wouldn't say because you have to think about this when you're talking about evolution, it's life or death, and whether mm -hmm. menstruation occurs or doesn't occur is not going to affect life or death. It may cause anemia or other medical conditions characterized by loss of blood and hemoglobin, but it's not going to cause death. I want someone else. I want I want us to think think hard. Is it because like you're in like internal, you you can only like produce a limited amount, like one, but like external, you like fishes like they can like excrete like many gametes at one time. Very good, right? And going going back to Nemo, I guess you can learn this all through watching Finding Nemo. There were so many over, so many fertilized eggs, and I think some kind of fish destroyed all of them, but Nemo, right? If that were not to happen, multiple fish would have been born out of one fertilization event, right? So I guess the, one of the key things is there's significantly less energy required in external fertilization. You don't need to meet two organisms. They don't even need to mate, and they don't need to mate one time for each new organism. So it's much less energy intensive. So that's evolutionarily beneficial. What else? Think about a mother, right? Think about carrying a fetus for nine months. I'll give you a lot of hints. For mothers, this is kind of, kind of the sad thing, is that one in five pregnancies end up with a miscarriage. It's actually very, very common. And that's due to chromosomal genetic abnormalities that we'll talk about later in module six. But uh, it places a lot of stress on mother as well, right? The fetus is quite literally a parasite, right? And I'm not saying this in a bad way. It literally will release hormones from the placenta that it takes mum's glucose, mum's nutrients, and takes it across the placenta into the fetal bloodstream. In that process, mum's blood glucose goes up, and sometimes mums get diabetes in pregnancy, right? Additionally, they'll get fatigue, anemia, headache, vomiting, nausea, bleeding, pain, and the process of childbirth, if without medical intervention, can cause massive bleeding and mortality. So I think you all notice that for those nine months that a female carries a fetus, it is a huge strain physiologically, right? There's a huge strain on the body. And if you're talking in terms of evolution, is that favorable for survival in that nine month period against predators, uh, lack of food, nutrients? Would that be beneficial to place yourself in a physically and metabolically uh, limited state for nine months? No, I hope you all understand the answer is no. So from an evolutionary standpoint, external fertilization is lower energy and it does not compromise the parent's health. Those are the two big reasons why external fertilization propagated or flourished in aquatic environments. Okay, now I'm hinting you all something. The most common question you will get for internal external fertilization is compare the two. So you should all be drawing maybe a table with pros and cons of each. So I've kind of given you all a little bit of a hint. OK, so less energy expenditure for external fertilization. And there is also less compromise on the parent, specifically the mother's health in external fertilization. Would you also say it's less time consuming as well and less maintenance? Because like if they have a lot of eggs and stuff, they don't really need to just take care of one child because essentially they just care about like reproduction like surviving for the next generation yeah in fact jessica i just think about this if if one fish were to release its ova another fish were to release its matters over five kilometers away how would they know which which eggs or fertilized eggs are their are their daughter cells unlike nemo in reality fish will just let the eggs hatch and the, and the young fish will just grow and uh, mature themselves. There isn't any nurturing done after birth as well. That's I think that's uh, what you're alluding to, which is there's much less effort involved as well. But I guess you can all break that down into less energy expenditure. And that's to, there's no need for mating in external fertilization. And there is less care of the fetus and of after birth as well. Very good. Good. Now... What are the cons of external fertilization? I'm making it sound really good. I think I've made a lot of cons for pregnancy, but pregnancy is so important for propagation continuity of human and terrestrial life. What are the pros of internal fertilization? 
Very good. Got a good, lot of good hands. So I guess we'll start with Sashida. What's a pro? Um, I was going to say a con for external is that a lot of gamuts can get wasted yeah very good right so again <laughs> i don't want to keep going to nemo but a lot of the gametes that are made will not successfully fertilize and even if they fertilize they will not successfully form a daughter organism right because they're prone or they're exposed to the external environment so i guess in an exam the way i'd phrase this is that yeah so a significant number of gametes are lost prior to fertilization, as there will not be union of spermatozoa and ova. Because think about this, the ocean is huge. One fish releasing spermatozoa and another fish releasing ova, it's quite a low likelihood that the two sex cells will meet. The likelihood of fertilization is much, much higher in internal fertilization, because it's happening inside the female reproductive tract. There is minimal distance that needs to be covered to cause the fertilization process. Whereas you need to cover kilometers, like a cross country marathon for the two gametes to meet each other underwater. So there is a higher likelihood of fertilization in internal fertilization, and the fertilized gametes have an increased likelihood of maturing into offspring because they're protected inside the female reproductive tract. Very good. So two increased likelihoods are the two pros of internal fertilization. Increased likelihood of fertilization, increased likelihood of birth. Does that make sense to all of us? Good. Any other pros or cons that we can think of? See a few hands still up. Pranav, what do you think? So one of the cons for external fertilization is also like, like even after they're fertilized, like um, there's like predators which might like, um, affect you know how much so, yeah very good so like we mentioned that links back to increased likelihood of birth even after fertilization for internal reproduction because it's protected in the female reproductive tract good so uh, Pranav just explained that one of the factors that can decrease survival of your zygotes underwater is those zygotes are prone to predation as well good Ethan give me one more Okay. Oh, well, that's, that's basically everything I've been like thinking of. I can't think of another. Jessica, do you think of anything else? Um, no, not really. Yeah, good, because I think we've exhausted it. Those would be the main, main reasons. Okay. The only other thing I would mention in your exams, I think you all know this, but uh, you need to release a large amount of ova and spermatozoa to cause external fertilization, right? So that, on the other hand, is a huge usage of resources as well. Whereas for internal fertilization, a female only needs to release one ova. Sure, there are millions of spermatozoa that will try to move and fertilize that one ova, but there'll only need to be one ova released. So I guess there's less usage of maternal sex cells in internal fertilization. That's all, I guess, band six, a very specific points but here is your table that links all the key points you need to know about internal and external fertilization so anything you missed i want you to to quickly jot down right now remember you're going to get printed copies of these books so these are my notes so don't worry about uh copying everything down just everything highlighted in black would be very important to say Okay, and I think one thing we can add to this is that post-fertilization, and it's kind of already mentioned here, but post-fertilization, the embryo is already protected. So it's more likely to be born as well. So that can increase likelihood of continuity. And I guess the key point is that there is a huge energy expenditure in internal fertilization, huge any of you are interested in pediatrics or obstetrics which is delivering births it's a very very energy intensive process and uh yeah does anyone know what a cesarean section is oh uh, yeah cesarean tanisha it's it's called like a c-section in short and that's when um the mother can't deliver the baby 
like normally. So they have to cut into the uterus and take out the baby and the placenta and mm -hmm. everything. Why would we want to do that? So what would be In the reason? case, like there's high risks if she actually gives birth normally, like naturally. Mm, yeah, very good. So there are many reasons. One of the most common reasons is the woman chooses to get a cesarean because pushing of vaginal delivery is quite strenuous and uh, it can cause tears in tissue as well. So sometimes cesarean is a very controlled method of reducing that. And then other reasons would be if the pelvis, so the bone that uh, is the outlet for a female is very small. Right. So if the hips are very small as well, that can increase the difficulty of a cesarean section as well. And other reasons could be if the placenta, which is that's one of the cool things in internal fertilization. You literally make an organ in those nine months that a female is pregnant. There is no other time in the human body where you will create a whole extra organ that is a mixture of your cells and a mixture of the other parent cells and then transiently get rid of it after nine months. It's one of the very interesting physiological changes that occurs in the human body. So yeah, if the placenta is covering it, if there's increased bleeding risk, sometimes infection, if the baby's heart rate starts dropping in the process of vaginal delivery, you'd need to switch to cesarean. So all of that's things that obstetrician. Um, I have a question. Yeah. So you know how you said that the gametes have to be like in a solution in the body kind of? to like i guess work um what if you like do make like an artificial uterus i guess like and just submerge the gametes in like water or something well water would not be the only thing that the gametes need they need hormones as well and the hormones would not be able to be made and be controlled in a, such an organized manner outside of the female reproductive tract there is so much more than just water water is one of the i guess it's one percent of what a gamete needs and a zygote needs to progress and mature into a new organism it needs the constant input and output of different hormones at different levels it needs to be protected from infection it needs a good blood supply nutrients glucose and thus it's very hard to make an artificial uterus and this is the thing you'll all realize even in 2021 we struggle to make replacements for normal organs. The best outcome whenever an organ fails is transplanting an organ because we don't have any machinery that can replicate any of your organs as well as the engineering that's in the human body. So it is so, so complex. And I think you'll have to realize biology is a study of yourself. You're learning about how you work, right? And you'll start to realize how complex beyond your wildest imaginations, you, your cells, the brain, the tissues, everything is. So it's quite interesting that, so yeah, to sum it up, it's much more than water. Good, all right. So here is just a quick electron micrograph of spermatozoa. So this is a scanning electron micrograph image. You would have learned about this in year 11. You get a 3D image, you colorize it, and you start to see the ova and the spermatozoa around it. Good, we're going to talk about that very soon. I might give you a break very soon, but before that, I want to just mention one very important thing. And so we are currently looking at now our next dot point, which should be listed here. This is a really high yield dot point, okay? And I guess I'll teach this to you after your break. But this is one of those dot points that students don't learn well at school. They don't understand. They don't have any principles for. And they go around 15 days before the HSC and they panic because they don't understand how hormones are working in pregnancy. So if you do not, um, I guess, if you want to be on top of that, if you do not want to be that student, make sure after your break, you come fully attentive, fully aware. You ask as many questions as you can and I will make you a master of pregnancy and hormones. It's actually very easy to understand if you practice and pay attention when I explain it to you. So, uh, yes, and Lookman, yes, you will get these notes and specifically a printed copy as well once we go back to Incenta. Okay, so yeah, I think you will get this next week if you are trialing this week. Good. Now, 
Everyone take your break, go stand up and stretch. If you sit for an hour, you are sending neural signals that you want to fall asleep. So make sure you stand up, stretch, walk around, do a bit of, do a few push-ups if you want to, get some water and I'll see you all in at 12.10 or 12.11, okay? Good. Oh, so. Yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask, is IVF like external fertilization or? Do you know what in vitro means? It means in a test tube. In vitro means in a test tube or a petri dish. So in vitro fertilization means fertilization in a petri dish. You literally get a needle and you inject a spermatozoa into an egg in a petri dish. You learn about that in mod six, but for now, that's all you need to know. Typically, fertilization should happen uh, going down. It should happen right here in the fallopian tube inside the femur reproductive tract. If it happens in a test tube or a petri dish, you call that IVF, okay? Right, thank you. Good question. All right, when everyone's back, it'd be great if those of you who could turn your cameras on can, and uh, the rest of you just raise your hand and you can bring it back down so I know that you're back. Good, okay, okay, good. All right, so you can all uh, lower your hands and we'll get continuing into pregnancy and hormones. Okay. Now, let's read this dot point first so we understand this. So I'll pull it up for all of you. Okay. Jessica, do you mind reading the dot point for us and uh, tell us the most important words you see here, which we'll highlight? Yeah. So is it the analyze? Good. So yeah. first verb. All right, so what does analyze mean to us? So Alyssa, when when you say the word analyze, how do you break that down? One of the first things I'd say is that it's very high yield, which means your long responses can come from hormonal control of pregnancy. Kirtana, is there anything else that you, you understand about analyze? Does anyone know the NASA definition of analyze? What you should have all done by now, if you haven't, you need to do this right after this lesson, is print the NASA verbs and stick it on your wall. That's very important. Is there anything else you should stick on your wall for the HSC, by the way? I don't think many people tell you this. What else should be on your wall? The syllabus, maybe? Uh, yeah, it'd be good to have. I think that'd be a very good addition. But remember, you're doing so many different subjects. Imagine having all your syllabi on top of your wall. It'd look like you're, you're plotting something. <laughs> Is there anything else? Yeah, I'd say ATAR goal would be a really good thing to have because it helps break down a number into what you need to do every day. I think the biggest issue that happens in the HSC is everyone says, you know, I want a 96 or I want a 94, or I want a 99.9, .9, but they just put that aside and they do whatever they can in the inner day. But all of you need to be able to break that ATAR goal down into what you need to do every single day, right? So one way to help do that is to have your ATAR goal stuck on that wall. What I'd encourage you all to do next is use a reverse ATAR calculator and find out the marks you need for all your subjects. You can just estimate for now and then ask your teachers. You know, I think all of you can do that. Ask your teachers what rank at your school got that mark. So let's say you all do the reverse calculator and let's say you all want to get over a 90 in biology. So you'd want to ask yourself, well, how many students in your school last year got a 90? And if it's six, guess what? You've broken down your ATAR goal into the rank you need at school. I think a lot of students don't do that. And so they get this huge discordance where they get the actual A turn. It's either much higher or much lower, which is much more common than what they wanted to get. So make sure you don't fall into that trap by doing that very early on. Coming back to this, yeah, your A turn goal, your career goal would be good and uh, have your syllabus. And so analyze. Georgina, any idea what it means? I know the Nessa meaning. Good, give it a go. Um, it's to define and outline the concepts and then you link them. Yeah, identify components and draw relationships, right? What that quite literally means is you should be able to define all the key terms, you need to identify the link between them and then explain implications or describe graphs. So analyze is one of the highest order verbs, which means you need to quite literally know how to interpret and uh, draw implications from data. Now, this is all about fertilization, implantation, 
and birth. There's also hormonal control here, but the key features here are fertilization, implantation, the process of pregnancy that leads to birth in mammals. So everything from fertilization to birth in mammals. So I guess let's start with this. What is a mammal? They'll never ask you to define a mammal, but you should generally know what you're talking about here. So mammals are a huge family in of living things that are characterized by these three key features. They all have mammary glands to some extent, which make milk. So that could be breast tissue in humans. That can be mammary glands even in, in the platypus, which is a monotreme, is what we call an egg-laying mammal. They also have mammary glands. So it's one of the key features of mammals is they all have mammary glands that produce their own type of milk. Okay. They're all also endothermic. What does endothermic mean? Pranav, I know you might know the chemistry definition, but do you know what the biology definition means? Like absorbing heat or like... Yeah, so that's what it means from a chemistry point of view. Endothermic from a biology point of view means that the chemical reactions in your body are releasing heat. And that heat is used by your own body to maintain its body temperature. So endotherms can always maintain their body temperature at a particular set point because their chemical reactions in their body generate heat. If you contrast that to a reptile, reptiles are what we call cold-blooded, right? And it doesn't quite literally mean their blood is cold. It just means they don't generate as much heat from their chemical reactions. So they can't keep their body temperature within a specific set point. So that's why reptiles need to go and you often see them, you know, basking in the sun when it's really cold to up their body temperature. Whereas us, if we're cold, we can start to shiver. We can start to raise our hairs. Our blood vessels can constrict and redirect warm blood to our internal organs, right? So I guess the key principle here is endotherm means chemical reactions make heat to maintain body temperature. Cushy, what should the human body temperature be? approximately um uh is it like 30s 30s in the 30s yeah in the 30s see if you were 30 you would have hypothermia your heart would stop and you would die so i guess the key principle here is we need it in a very very narrow set point extension question you all actually know why we need to have it in a very narrow set point but i want to see who can make the link why do we need a body temperature to be 36.5? If it's greater than 38, we call it a fever. If it's greater than 40, you have you have such a high fever, you're at risk of organ failure. So why are we in such a narrow limit for our Is body? Is do with that enzymes? Very good. Keep going. Keep going. Very good. Um, Because like our enzymes work at like specific temperatures. So if the temperature like decreases or increases, it stops working. I forgot the, what the word was. Yeah, they can denature in very high temperatures or they can become dormant in very low temperatures. So very good, right? So remember, you, the fact that you're alive right now is just because you're a set of chemical reactions that are all occurring in a very organized manner at a very, very fast rate. And that's helping you get rid of all your weights. That's helping you produce energy constantly. And that's fueling your thinking, your movement, you, everything about you. The second these enzymes decrease their rate of activity, the chemical reactions in the body will slow. And biochemically, death occurs when all your chemical reactions come to a halt, right? So we need these enzymes to be functional. And that's why high temperatures can denature the enzymes, stop all the chemical reactions, cause organ failure and death. Contrastingly, low temperatures will keep all the enzymes dormant, stop all the chemical reactions, can cause death. So I think you all realize body temperature needs to be very, very narrow, especially for your endotherms. And the last point is hair and fur to all varying extents. Don't memorize this. Just have a general idea of what a mammal is so you're not confused when the syllabus mentions that word to you. Forget about the three kinds of mammals. You can read that in your own time. That's very low yield as well. But it's interesting just to generally have a heading of what you're talking about here. Because you are going to become, by the end of this lesson, an expert on hormonal control in mammals. 
Now, let's start with this. What is a hormone? The H word comes up and a lot of students get intimidated by it because they don't understand what it actually is and how it works. So any idea what hormones are, everyone? Hormones. Um, they're chemical messengers. Very good. So what does that mean, Look, uh, Lookman? Because chemical messengers is a very broad term. You see that in a lot of your notes. But uh, can you do you mind telling me what it's made out of or how it goes to different sites or how it acts? So um, from what I know, I know they act on receptors. Very good. Okay. Um, and um, hormones are proteins, right? Yeah, very good. They can be proteins. There's different types, but one yeah. of is proteins. And I and guess one of the most common examples is insulin. And mm. uh, it's a complete protein or peptide hormone. Keep going. Um, and they, throw, they move around your body through your bloodstream. Good. Very good. And I guess the last thing, are they fast acting or slow acting, Lookman? Um, uh, slow. Yeah, very good. I'll, I'll tell you all a very important tip in biology, in science in general, or just to be a notch ahead in whatever you do. Whenever you're asked a tough question, use a thought experiment. So it can be as crazy or wild as you want to imagine. But the people who have revolutionized science used the craziest thought experiments and came to the coolest conclusions, right? If you've all maybe seen Interstellar, everything about that movie, the slowing of time when you start reaching relativistic speeds, is all true. And it's an implication of a man who just asked himself, would I see my reflection if I was on a train traveling at the speed of light? You might think, why was this guy even thinking about that? But uh, that simple thought experiment led to an entire theory that has changed mankind in a very similar similar way. Hormones, an example is testosterone, and hopefully you all know testosterone is a hormone, and people can use it, for example, when exercising to maximize muscle mass, right? Now, is that immediate, or does that take weeks to months? And the answer is it takes weeks to months. So hormones, in general, are very slow or short-acting, okay? Now... Very good. I think the one word that I'd like you all to remember is chemical messenger. So we'll keep that there. And I'll go down to hormones for all of you. Good. So Bookman nailed that. So chemical messengers travel in the bloodstream. Now I'm going to give you a bit more detail about hormones. Okay. The way they work, there are three different kinds in terms of their structure. Hormones can either be proteins or they can be the building block of proteins. Now who can tell me what that is? So, Jessica, what is the building block of a protein? Amino acids, I think. Yeah, some of them can be amino acids, right? Now, this social media has given cholesterol a really bad rap, right? Cholesterol is really bad for you, heart disease. And that is actually true to a large extent. But we need some cholesterol in the human body. It doesn't mean you should go and eat some butter or McDonald's right away. But cholesterol is essential for making hormones, right? And your body makes its own cholesterol from the consumption of healthy fats, like omega-3 fats, etc., right? And so some hormones, especially the pregnancy hormones that you're going to be studying now, are cholesterol-based. And that includes testosterone, estrogen, progesterone. And cholesterol, for you to all understand this, is very similar in structure to a fat. Where is it normally found? Uh, so in year 11, you learned that cholesterol is an important structural part of cells. Where do I find it in a cell? Is it the cell membrane? Very good, good. So those kinds of linkings uh, to year 11 are quite important to understand. But very good. So now you know what hormones are made up of. They're either proteins, the building block of proteins, or in the case of pregnancy, they are cholesterol-based hormones like testosterone. And maybe I'll write this for you. Test osterone, progesterone, and estrogen. And I'll write the full names since it's the first time you'd have heard of these hormones. Progesterone, testosterone, and estrogen. Okay, very good. So hormones are typically produced in various structures. We call these glands. Glands are organs that produce hormones. Okay, and they cause a huge variety of effects. Does anyone know what any of these glands release? I'm giving you a bunch of glands. You know, it's quite overwhelming. Some of these glands, like the thymus, you'd have no clue what they do. That's fine. But uh, any of these glands, does anyone know what hormones any of these glands release? 
um, the pituitary gland releases uh, FSH and LH. Very good. Good job. So that's specifically to do with pregnancy. Good. Uh, a few other examples. I guess your thyroid hormone rele releases, sorry, your thyroid gland makes thyroid hormone, and that goes to increase your metabolism. So people with too much thyroid hormone get jitters, they get really hot, their heart rate goes up, and uh, the pancreas releases insulin. And when you don't make enough insulin or the body does not respond to this insulin, you get the number one cause of death on the planet for humans. What is this disease I'm talking about that is characterized by some resistance or an inadequate production of insulin? I'm sure you all know at least one person with this disease. It's one of the most common diseases on the planet. It's a silent killer because you won't even tell. You can't tell when you have diabetes. You won't be able to feel that your blood sugar is too high. But uh, that is one of the key diseases, and it's a number one cause of death on this planet. So in module seven and eight, you'll become a master of diabetes. So that's how hormones will link. Now, how do they act? We understand that they travel in the bloodstream. So I'm going to draw, imagine this is a hormone. It's going to get released from a gland. So now we understand that these sac-like structures or glands release the hormones. They will travel in the bloodstream. But then how do they act on cells? So let's say we have a cell that we want this hormone to act on. What will the hormone do? I guess I'll come back to you, Lookman, since you have some understanding of hormones so far. Um, it would bind to the uh, receptor proteins on the membrane. Good. Could be on the membrane. It could be in the nucleus, right? It could be nuclear receptors as well. And do we know how they act? Uh, no. So the way they act is they change gene expression. And that is why they're so slow acting, right? Now, Rhea... What is a gene? Um, a gene is part of DNA and it has like, yep, whatever you're writing, yep. Good. Sequence of DNA and it codes for A. Almost gave it away. Who can tell me? What does a gene make? Each gene makes one unit of something. What does it make? Polypeptide. Very good. Okay. Polypeptide. Oh, yeah. So we can call it a protein for now, but later I will teach you the difference between a polypeptide and a protein. But uh, yeah, think of it as a polypeptide or a protein, right? So this takes some time. It takes time for genes or the letters of DNA to make a polypeptide. Think about the letters of DNA kind of like an instruction manual. And if I gave you all the instruction manual right now to make an IKEA chair or table, it would take you hours. In the same way, it takes a cell hours to completely make large quantities of a protein from a gene. So all hormones do is they tell a cell to make more of one protein or make less of another protein. Does that make sense to everyone? And that's going to have all the other effects on the human body. Okay, good. So now you should generally understand hormones. We're now going to go back to pregnancy and start talking about how fertilization, implantation, all of those processes work. So remember, the first process you needed to understand was fertilization. And even before the process of fertilization, what you need to understand is what we call ovulation. Okay. Now, hormones are going to trigger ovulation. We'll talk about the hormones shortly, but I want you to just remember it is triggered by hormones. And ovulation is a process by which the ova, which is a female sex cell, gets released from the ovaries. And the ovaries are quite literally a reservoir of ova. So an interesting point is, do we know how long it takes a male to fully produce spermatozole? So if, to make a spermatozole from scratch, how many days does it take a male of reproductive age? Any ideas, Pranav? Just give me a guess. Is it like 70 days? Amazing. I'm actually very surprised some of you understand this stuff. So 70 plus minus about four, four-ish days. That's how long it takes a male to produce spermatozoa, right? And you don't need to know that for those of you who didn't know, which is very good you did know that. Over, on the other hand, are so different. A female never, ever makes new over after birth. In fact, a female, kind of imagine it like a basket, right? Every female is born with the maximum amount of ova that she will ever have in her life. And through the process of aging, 
progressively the ova get exposed to radiation, to carcinogens in food, and they start to degenerate to the point of about 40, where the ova are all poor quality, and thus it increases your risk of mutations in birth, such as Down syndrome, etc. And a lot of HSC questions will ask you this principle. They'll show you graphs with age and a fertilization rate and ask you why it drops so significantly. And it's because females are born with all their ova and they get exposed to mutations and uh, radiation and carcinogens. And remember, carcinogen just causes DNA damage, and that will eventually decrease the viability of that ova for fertilization. Good. So what happens is, due to hormonal influences, after a certain age, typically about 9 to 11 in females, they will begin the process of ovulation. Okay, And about every 28 days, they will release one ova. So within the middle of each cycle, so day 14 of that cycle. And we'll talk about all of that soon, but just remember, rhythmically, we will release one ova. Now that ova is going so you just muted yourself by accident. How long was I muted for? No, just for like two seconds. Okay, good. Thanks for thanks for mentioning that. But yeah, so the ova is f released from the ovaries and it sits in the outer one third of the fallopian tube and it waits. And only if the terrestrial organism engaged in reproduction, only then will spermatozoa be released into the vaginal canal. So remember, the vaginal canal is sitting here. Just to give you a bit of anatomy, this would be your vagina. Your uterus sits superior. That's what we typically say in medicine, or you can say on top of that. And we call the lower portion of the uterus, we call it the cervix. So those are just the general structures you need to understand. You have the vagina and a vaginal canal, and then we have a cervix, which is a lower portion of the uterus and then the uterus itself, and that connects to this tube that's known as your fallopian tube, okay? And as you can all see, the fallopian tube kind of flails out, and it is in very close contact to the ovaries. Good, so I'll come back to this. All right. Okay, so remember that we have ovulation occurring rhythmically. The ova will sit in out of one third of the fallopian tube, and if the process of reproduction occurred, we will then have fertilization. And that's what you're all seeing there. Okay. Now, what will happen then if fertilization occurs about seven days later, about a week after fertilization, that zygote will continue to multiply again and again and again. Do you all see how it's multiplying into multiple cells and then it starts to get fluid and those cells start to clump up at the edge? And finally, it'll go and implant into the wall of the uterus, and that's what we call the endometrium. The lining cells of the uterus is known as the endometrium, okay? And so that is the physical processes. I haven't spoken about any hormones yet because you need to first understand what's going on, is that we have ovulation rhythmically. If somatozoa meet the ova, we'll get fertilization in the fallopian tube, and then the zygote, from fertilization is going to multiply again and again until it forms a clump of cells that will implant into the endometrium about seven days later. Does that make sense to all of us? I know it's a lot to digest, but do we have any questions so far? Oh, I have a question. Yeah. Um. So do you know when you when you get pregnant and then when you take a pregnancy test, mm. what changes in the pee to show you that you are pregnant? Oh, very, very good question. I like these questions, Georgina. I'm going to teach you that very soon, but it's a hormone, and I don't want to mention this hormone without explaining all the hormones, because in isolation, if I just teach you this hormone, it will uh, not make much sense. But I'll give you the name of the hormone. It's called a beta-HCG test, or a beta-human chorionic gonadotropin test. So we'll be looking at the urine for that. And uh, a little hint, that only becomes positive after implantation. So let's say fertilization has happened, right? Let's say someone has had intercourse. Within two days, fertilization needs to happen. If that fertilization has happened, the pregnancy test will not be positive until it implants one week later. So uh, implication of this is if someone engages in reproduction 
A pregnancy test a day or two later will not give you any results. It needs to be done at least a week later, okay? Otherwise, it's not going to detect anything, okay? So, uh, yeah, but we'll come back to that. Now, I'm going to talk about hormones, but do we have any other questions about the structures? So, you need to be able to label the uterus, the cervix, the vagina, the fallopian tube, and ovaries. And uh, does anyone have any questions about the processes that have occurred so far? Good. Okay. One other word I'll give you is you would have heard of this term embryo. Yeah. Embryo, fetus, blastocyst. Anyone know what the differences are? It's like, what do you call this? Is that a zygote still after it's divided? Or is it a blastocyst now? Is it an embryo? Is it a fetus? Anyone have any clues? Tanisha, do you have any ideas? Um, I think it's embryo when it's like done dividing and then it becomes a fetus when the um, structures start forming, like the head, the heart and stuff. Mm, yeah, sort of. So normal pregnancy is about 36 to 40 weeks, right? Just to give you a general timing. Okay. And what happens is, you remember that part where I told you fluid starts to form? So we had that zygote, the zygote undergoes mitosis. Right, and we call this clump of cells a morella. You do not need to know that, but that's just what that word means. It's a clump of cells. But as soon as fluid starts to form, we call this fluid a blastocele, and hence you can start calling it a blastocyst. And the only reason I'm mentioning this is technically the thing that implants into the endometrium is the blastocyst. So if you want to be very correct, you would mention the zygote undergoes replication and the blastocyst will implant into the endometrium, okay? Now, embryo and fetus, I'll just give you a general rule of thumb because you don't need to know the details. There's specific things we look for to diagnose it as a fetus. But uh, when it looks like an alien, it's an embryo. And when it starts looking like an actual baby, it's, uh, it's a fetus in your head. That's all I want you to understand, okay? And I guess the reason I'm mentioning this is if I were to search and show you, so uh, embryo this works okay it might lag but uh while we're waiting for that maybe you can all search up what an embryo looks like maybe search embryo seven weeks and you'll see that it looks quite literally like an alien and so uh fetus is usually after 12 weeks gestation but uh it starts to look more like a baby after the 12 weeks okay all right let's move on to hormones now Hormones are very powerful, as you all realized, right? These chemical messengers can change the amount of one protein, decrease the amount of another protein. And when you have abnormal levels of hormones, that gives you disease. So what did we say was a disease caused by abnormal insulin released by the pancreas? Diabetes. Diabetes. Does anyone know what we call the disease where you have uh, too much thyroid hormone released by the thyroid gland? I've never heard of this. It affects women quite a lot hypothyroidism right and there are many causes of this certain cancers it could be uh, potentially autoimmune diseases where the body attacks its own tissues and it's very common uh, in females compared to males hypothyroidism right and you can also have abnormalities here where brain tumors can compress here and start releasing hormones from the brain and you see all sorts of weird stuff from males starting to produce breast milk and lactating to uh, individuals who start releasing or raising their blood pressure or changing their entire skeletal structure. So the key point I'm trying to mention here is hormones are very, very dangerous and they need to be controlled in very fine-tuned level by the human body. And so the way we do that is through a regulator system. And so let me show you all. So this is just a zoom into the different kinds of hormones we said we said they can be made out of amino acids so that's an amino acid just so you see what it looks like here is a peptide or a protein hormone and here you can see your cholesterol hormones they have these rings can everyone see they're all carbons these rings so it's just made out of carbons and oxygens and hydrogens good but uh we shall move on and this is just a little diagram showing you a hormone traveling the bloodstream binding to receptors, going into a cell, and then it can either activate proteins, etc. or it can travel in the nucleus and change the amount of genes produced. Forget all of this. 
That's all you need to understand. Goes into the cell, binds to receptors, and can change the amount of protein that we produce. Very good. There you can see all of that happening. So this is a hormone going straight into DNA and changing the amount of protein that that gene produces. Now, this is what we're going to talk about regarding hormones. Now, hormones are controlled by what we call a hypothalamic pituitary axis. And the way this occurs is that you have a structure in your brain. So what, what you see here is imagine that you got like a samurai sword and you've just gone straight through the center of someone's skull, side view. This is exactly what you'd see as a cross section. OK, so first thing you got to do is orient yourself with these images. This is a brain. This is the front. This is the back. The brain is one of the most interesting organs uh, ever to exist because everything about you, your personality, your consciousness, your food desires, your everything is all in, in this part of the brain, the frontal area. And uh, you have many other sites. The back of the brain. Does anyone know what the back of the brain does? Is that um, like memories and stuff? Yeah, so memory is more the hippocampus, which is the side or the temporal lobe, the side of the brain. The back of the brain is associated with vision. So your eyes will send nervous signals to the occipital lobe or the back of the brain to encode the world around you. So yeah, the brain is very, very interesting, but we're going to focus solely on hormones at this point here. So right in the center of the brain, you have this structure here where all fibers must pass through. It's kind of like the entry to the brain, the door to the house. This is known as your thalamus. And right underneath the thalamus, this structure here, right in the center of the brain, since it's under the thalamus, we say it's hypo, because hypo means less or below, hypothalamus. In the hypothalamus, you will have to know how to spell the structure, first of all. You'd have to know what it does because it comes back in module eight as well, and module seven for that matter. But the hypothalamus is the master controller of hormone release. And the way this works is the hypothalamus will usually be secreting a master hormone, and that master hormone will then act on other structures to control other hormones being released. Okay? Now, what you will see is directly under the hypothalamus, you have this little sac-like structure. Does everyone see this? This sac-like structure directly underneath the hypothalamus. This is known as your pituitary gland. And typically what's going to happen is a hypothalamus will release a master regulatory hormone that will travel to the pituitary, and that will stimulate the pituitary to release its own set of hormones. And those hormones will travel in the bloodstream to go all over the body and act on all the other glands you saw. Okay? So to give you all a little case example, just to help you understand this, there is a hormone called thyrotropin-releasing hormone. Okay? You don't need to memorize these words, but just know there is a master hormone that then goes to the pituitary and causes the release of a hormone called thyroid-stimulating hormone. That will then travel in the bloodstream to the thyroid gland. So let's go back up and have a look at where the thyroid gland is. If you're all really good, you might even be able to feel your thyroid gland. It's directly underneath your Adam's apple. If you feel any soft tissue mass, it's probably your thyroid gland. So it will travel in the blood down to the thyroid gland and control the amount of thyroid hormone release. If there's too much thyroid hormone, the brain will release less of those master control hormones and that will decrease the amount of thyroid hormone released. Contrastingly, if we have too low of thyroid hormone, the brain will release more master regulatory hormones that will stimulate more thyroid hormone production. Does everyone see the control that is going on there? Now, a very similar control happens when it talks about reproduction as well. So let me take you all to this diagram here. Okay. This is the most important hormone diagram that you will ever need to know. Because if you understand this diagram, every question about pregnancy and hormones is easy. Okay. So we'll start with this. Harsha, where was the hypothalamus again? Uh, in the back portion of the brain. Does everyone agree? Was it back portion of the brain or center of the brain? Center. Yeah. 
The hypothalamus is right in the center. So imagine center, dead center of the brain. That's where you'd have your hypothalamus, okay? And directly under the hypothalamus, you will have a sac-like structure known as your pituitary, right? And what did we say? The hypothalamus always releases a master hormone. Now, in the case of reproduction, this is for males and females, the onset of puberty, if you want to know what specific chemical in your body caused puberty to occur, it is this hormone right here that I'm highlighting. This hormone stands for gonadotropin releasing hormone. Does anyone know what gonadotropin means? Or can anyone guess what they have to do with? I'll give you a hint. Um it's got something to do, yeah. Got something to do for your gonads. Yeah, and what are the gonads? Um those are the um reproductive organs that produce gametes and stuff. Very good. Testes, yeah. Organs that make gametes. So for females it's your ovaries and for males it's your testes, right? Interestingly, each and every one of you we're actually born female, right? Uh, not born, but in utero, you were all by default females. And the action of the Y hormone, as you all know, females are XX, males are XY. The action of the Y hormone will release, uh, the Y chromosome will release hormones that will cause the ovaries to differentiate into testes. They're actually the same structure, just slightly differently modified through hormones. So that's another interesting point. So hopefully you're all learning a few interesting things in biology, not just boring school stuff, right? Good. So coming back to this, gonadotropin releasing hormone tells you it has something to do with the gonads. And this master control hormone is released from the brain and it goes and acts on the pituitary gland to release these two hormones. Okay, and we'll talk about these very soon. Now, if I were to ask an economics major or any literature or non-science person, what gonadotropin releasing hormone does, what would be a very simple answer they could give? So taking all the science out of it, you have a hormone called gonadotropin releasing hormone. What do you think it does? Georgina? Releases hormone. Oh. Releases gonadotropin. Does everyone agree? Gonadotropin releasing hormone should do what its name says, which is releases gonadotropins. There are two gonadotropins in the pituitary. One is called LH, or luteinizing hormone. Luteinizing hormone. And the other one is called FSH, or follicle-stimulating hormone. Follicle-stimulating hormone. Those are the two different gonadotropins in the pituitary. So what's going to happen now, just putting you in context, that GNIH has gone to the pituitary and it acts on the pituitary, pituitary and it causes the release of the two gonadotropins, LH and FSH. In your exams, you only need to mention LH and FSH. You don't need to mention the full names. Okay? Very good. Now, what they're going to do is think about this. I want you all to tell me, where's your head and where are your reproductive organs? They're very far apart. Does everyone agree? So what needs to happen is we need some kind of highway for these hormones to travel down to reach the gonads. Now I'll draw the gonads as two spherical structures because that's how the ovaries would look, that's how the testes would look, okay? Good, so they're gonna travel down the bloodstream and they're going to act on the reproductive structures. Now we're looking at pregnancy, so forget about the testes, but it's the exact same pathway for the testes. In this case, we're focusing solely on the ovaries, okay? So this LH and FSH are going to travel to that ovary and cause the release of two hormones. Any idea what those two hormones are, everyone? Listed here. Estrogen. Yeah, or Jessica, anyone? Come and tell oh. me, what are the two hormones? Estrogen and progesterone. Yeah, estrogen and progesterone, very good. So those are the two final hormones that are being released, estrogen, and progesterone. Look at how crazy the body goes, the depths or the limits that it goes to simply to control these two hormones. Think about this. All of this control is just to control the amount of estrogen and progesterone released, right? We have a whole hypothalamus that releases a master hormone, goes to the pituitary, releases gonadotropins, travel in the bloodstream, 
they will release estrogen and progesterone from the ovaries. Now, I want you to look back in this diagram on the right and tell me what haven't I explained? I'll give you a hint. What's going on here? What is all of this? Does anyone know what we call this? Feedback loops. Yeah, very good. These are very important loops in nature. Because think about this, right? Theoretically, the brain's always making GnRH. So that's always going to make more LH and FSH, which is going to always travel to the ovary and increase estrogen and progesterone. By that logic, estrogen and progesterone should exponentially increase over time because they're always being stimulated. Does everyone agree? Right? However, in reality, what we notice is estrogen and progesterone follow almost a cyclical pattern. And the reason that is, is the estrogen and progesterone that's being made will then go back to the pituitary and go back to the hypothalamus and inhibit further hormone release. So they're going to inhibit GnRH, they're going to inhibit LH and FSH. And what that does is lower LH and FSH means that estrogen levels will start to drop. So do you see how it's almost like a self-controlling feedback loop? And that keeps estrogen and progesterone within normal levels. You need to mention negative feedback. Good. Does anyone have any questions about this hormone loop? It's very important. And this is how we ensure that estrogen and progesterone levels stay in normal limits. I want you to apply a quick thought experiment for me, right? Uh, let's say Tashvia. Let's say my estrogen is too high. What is that going to do to the to the negative feedback to GnRH and LH and FSH? Quickly, guys, Tashvia. I'm not sure. Think about this. I never want you guys to answer with I'm not sure. I want you to always give it some kind of go. Okay. So estrogen levels here have increased, what is that going to do to the amount of negative feedback on the brain, Tashvia? Will it increase or will it decrease? Think about this. Estrogen is causing negative feedback, right? So if you have more estrogen, what does that mean to the amount of negative feedback? More. Yeah, right? So since we have more estrogen, it's going to go back up to the brain and cause more negative feedback, inhibiting that GnRH. What is then going to happen to the GnRH, everyone? It's going to decrease. What's going to happen to LH and FSH? Jessica? Um, it's going to increase. Think about this. The GnRH has decreased. And remember, GnRH stimulates LH and FSH. So what's going to happen to LH and FSH? It's going to decrease. Good. And then that's meant to go and stimulate estrogen in the ovary. So what's going to happen to estrogen levels? Increase. Think about this, your LH and FSH have decreased. Okay. Normally, they stimulate estrogen. They've decreased now. So what's going to happen to estrogen levels? Going to go up or down? Down. Down. So do you all see, whenever estrogen drops, it's a self-fulfilling loop. It'll start to go down again because of negative feedback. Contrastingly, let me get rid of all my arrows. I don't want to confuse you all. What about if my estrogen was too low, right? Uh, Estrogen is too low. Now, Alyssa, when my estrogen is too low, what happens to the amount of negative feedback of estrogen back on the brain? Um, will it tell it to increase the amount of GnRH? Okay, good, but I don't want you to think of it like that. I want you to think of the extent of negative feedback. Is it going to be more negative feedback or less negative feedback that we have less estrogen? Less. Good, it's going to be less negative feedback by estrogen because there's lower estrogen. So what is that going to do to GnRH levels now? They're not being inhibited as much. So will they go up or down? I want you to keep going, Alyssa. Will they go up or down? Sorry, what was the question? There's less negative feedback back on the brain, right? That's usually inhibiting your GnRH. If you have less inhibition, will GnRH go up or down? Up. Good. And now that's going to go and stimulate LH and FSH. So is that going to go up or down? Up as well. Good. And what happens to estrogen as a result? It's going to increase. Does everyone understand that? If you didn't understand that, you don't understand negative feedback. But that is negative feedback in action. Do you see? Because we have these three levels of control, that whenever you have fluctuations of estrogen, it'll always be counteracted and returned to normal. 
Do we have any questions at all so far? Uh, yeah. Um, so what does a negative feedback, like in general terms, what does that actually mean? Like if, is it good if it's negative or is it bad? It's, it's essential. If you don't have negative feedback, remember the hormone levels will exponentially increase. That'll cause disease because remember any abnormality of hormones will lead to some form of disease and that can result in death, right? So we need tight control of hormones. And so that's ensured through negative feedback. So negative feedback is an essential mechanism of controlling levels of hormones in the body. So it's very good, very important. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, um, if you don't mind, I have another question. Yeah, sure. Um, so, okay, I get that part, but if, so, negative fear about what, what is that telling the hypothalamus? Is that saying that you need to produce more or less? Very good question. So, negative feedback is when estrogen travels back in the blood, goes back to the brain, and inhibits further secretion of GnRH. So, it's telling the hypothalamus to make less. That's why it's called negative feedback. If it was telling the hypothalamus to make more, it would be called positive feedback. Does that make sense? Think of it like an exam, right? If you do something and you get negative feedback, it's telling you to stop doing that thing. That's what it's implying. And it's the same way in the brain, right? It travels back in the brain and it tells the brain to make less hormone. That's why it's called negative feedback. Good. Any other questions at all from anyone? Um, I have a question. Yeah. So are LH and FSH the types of gonads? So gonads are your testes in your ovary. That's what gonads are. LH and FSH are examples of gonadotropins, which means hormones that will act on the gonads. That's what gonadotropin means. Okay. okay. Thank so you. Very good question. Your gonads are structures, like your testes in your ovary. Your gonadotropins are hormones that will act on the gonads. In this case, it's the LH in your FSH. Good. Any other questions at all? Okay, good. Varun? Uh, so, so for negative feedback, does the brain or the hypo, hypothalamus detect like the amount of estrogen in the bloodstream? Yes. And then, like, okay. Yeah, so it'll detect the amount of estrogen in the bloodstream. And if estrogen is high, that means the estrogen will travel to the hypothalamus and inhibit or negative feedback uh, the production of GnRH. So GnRH will start to drop. Yeah, good. Lookman, question? Um, why is progesterone only given negative feedback? Feedback. Okay, so what you see, I think what you're seeing is estrogen has a positive sign here as well. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I want you to ignore that for now. I haven't mentioned anything about positive feedback. So for now, ignore it. It will only make sense in a specific context. So for now, remember, both progesterone and estrogen only do negative feedback. Okay. So forget about that plus sign for now. I will teach you next lesson when we get a positive feedback. And so next lesson, I guess this is a table of uh, all these hormones and what they do, for example. And we'll talk about that next lesson. And I guess the goal of next lesson will be for you to understand this graph. It comes up a ton in your exams. And it basically is about how all these hormones change in explaining what causes ovulation hormonally, right? Now, I guess before we finish up, everyone, if you had to put your money on it, what hormone do you think is causing ovulation? Just looking at this graph, forget everything else. What hormone spikes to cause ovulation? It's a very high yield exam question. Uh, LH. Very good, right? So one of the most important parts about LH is that LH will slowly increase over time and in that 28-day menstrual cycle, we'll talk about that very soon, what day one, what day 28, all of that means. But at a certain point, remember I told you rhythmically, you'll get a surge in LH that is responsible for ovulation. So that would be one of the most high-yield parts about this dot point here. They'd love to ask that question. But again, like I said, we'll come back and we'll explain this entire pregnancy and hormones graph soon. Okay? Good. You ordered really well. So like I told you, You'll understand next lesson why once you know this graph, everything about pregnancy and hormones becomes much, much easier. Good. Um, Prithvi, I have another question. It's just a yeah. random question. Well, what's the difference between hyperthyroidism and hypothyroidism? Hypo, remember in general, hypo means low or below. So when someone has hypothyroidism, they have very low thyroid hormone. 
So they would have, for example, a slowed metabolism. They'd gain weight. They could have constipation. They could have menstrual bleeding. They can have uh, fatigue. There's a lot of weird things that happen in thyroid problems. Endocrinology, which is a study of hormones, is very, very complex, but there is a lot to it. But yeah, hypo means low, hyper, H-I-P-E-R means high. Okay. Okay, thank you. Good. All right, guys, you did really well this lesson. I know it's a lot of content, but this is how you top will be. There'll be a huge learning curve, but you'll all get used to it. When we do exam questions, it'll make more and more sense. So uh, for homework, what I would encourage you all to do is uh, start doing all the questions up until page, uh, you're on page 60, 60. So aim to do all the questions up to page 60, and you should also start to do the HSC additional questions uh, booklet. That's also on the edX website as well. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Um. So, like I said, I'm new. So how do I get? The, do I have to wait to next lesson or? Yes. So you have to oh, wait okay. to next lesson for access, Lookman. I think yeah. uh, admin will give you access sometime within this coming week. Okay. So no rush. Like I said, homework is collected cumulatively at the end of the ten week block before you sit your mod five exam. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, everyone. Good job. I'll see you all next week. Have a great week, and I'm always a message away if you have any questions. All the best. No, thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. Thank Bye. Bye, Aria. See you all. Bye. See ya. Um, Prithvi, I actually had a question. Mm -hmm.